just a few weeks ago that Freddie and I did a whole uh, kind of planning stages video talking about all the things I'm hoping to do and accomplish in my Star Wars room. Then I moved in to the new house and the bonus room upstairs was like the least important in terms of like trying to get the house livable. Then people in the Discord were like, uh, hey, I want to know about that Star Wars room. You teased it. You told us all your plans and, uh, you know, give us something. Then all of a sudden I would come up here and get overwhelmed by how much stuff there was to do. I mean, just boxes everywhere. What we count over 40 boxes of Star Wars collectibles. Um, they were just all over the room. I, I just felt absolutely paralyzed. My desk was in shambles. This cheap sucker that we bought at like a, I don't know, a yard sale 10 years ago. Uh, had just totally, you know, fallen apart on me, as did one of my bookshelves. Mm. Long story short, I finally have started working on the Star Wars room, and I'm excited to reveal my 12 foot by 8 foot photo mural of the Yavin hangar. It is behind me. I'm gonna have it looking better lit in future weeks, but uh, for tonight, that's what you guys can see. Um, you guys got a you got a picture for me, Rick? Like a better lit one to show off to the good folks what we got here? Yes, it's such a nice background. That, man, it looks like, you know, it could just be like a Zoom background, right? But no, this is a 12 foot by 8 foot photo mural that I friggin' plastered to the wall. Uh, <laughs> almost ended my marriage, let's be honest. <laughs> it was so unbelievably difficult to put up. And uh, it's here, and it looks awesome. You know, it, looks, uh, it would look better if I had a better lit in the room tonight. But like, uh, I did go out, for the record, in the snowstorm to try to get a battery for my LED strip lights to light this thing. Got the battery, didn't crash, hmm. almost did, and it still <laughs> doesn't work. But i um, very excited to get the show this off. Freddie, when we discussed it, I said, like, you know, I don't think I'm going to do the photo mural because it kind of feels like a shortcut. Yeah. Then I got in the room and was like, I definitely need a shortcut because this is <laughs> a lot of work. Hmm. It's amazing that that I I would love to do that on my wall. I feel like there's enough space there i might i might be able to get uh han and carbonite or uh ooh that'd be sick or you know like a portal to to like the millennium falcon oh you know like a no, i'll tell yeah. you this much the i'll send you a link to the website komar is mm-hmm. the name of the company they've got like a 100 star wars photo murals oh man uh oh. there's some really cool ones my daughter said when she saw how many there were i was going through on the website uh, she looked at me and she said, "Dad, you could collect these." Oh, you could, <laughs> she, she said, "You could put them on your other walls." Mm. And I was like, "I do like to collect things." My wife was like, "No, I am <laughs> not it, helping baby. you with another one of these." What's that, Freddie? I'm um, just saying, I, I definitely would agree with your child. <laughs> <laughs> Do it, Andrew. Cool. Do it, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> my uh, my wife's friend, when she showed them, she was like, "Well, at least they make these in." Um, Let's make wallpaper now with peel and stick. And my wife said, it was not peel and stick. And then uh, Rebecca's friend said, well, at least you have something to remember him by now that you've (laughs) murdered him. (laughs) Uh, But I have a fun announcement concerning the photo mural, Mm. concerning the Star Wars room. And Mm. that is tomorrow, launching for our $10 and up patrons. Tomorrow, we have a 10-ish minute video chronicling the painting and uh all the trials involved as well as the the uh the assembly of the star wars mural going up on patreon to patreon tomorrow that i am very excited to get to share with nice. the world there's a couple of twists and turns cool. along the way hmm. i'm gonna give a big shout out to our buddy nathan nathan who's been on the show for uh jedi academy roundtable right um nathan they put together the video for me in less than 24 hours notice wow so that is huge uh huge shout out to nathan uh do have a, a great question here in the chat is that r2 to scale uh, that'd be a no <laughs> <laughs> it's not just it is tiny it's this big but i'm trying to put it in the room just right where it kind of looks like you know kind of looks like it could fit you see what i'm saying like it could be you could have uh and like an R2 unit wandering around the room, right? Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. about the perspective. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm going to even assemble some of those crates to put over in the corner. Oh, like those, yeah. Uh, it looks like they're kind of coming out of the room. You're and gonna... that's where I'm going to stash the stuff that doesn't fit on my shelves. 
Nice. Yes. It's going to be like the volume in your house. Uh, you know what the volume is? Uh, yeah. That new filmmaking tool they're using for everything now, <laughs> Mandalorian and yeah. stuff. But that'd be awesome where you can have some practical and uh, printed uh, graphics. Man, that's, that's cool. Exciting. Got a lot of like fun that. stuff planned for the room. This was one thing I wanted to go ahead and get done because we're having new carpets put in. Uh, previous owners had a dog, also an indoor rabbit. So the whole house kind of got that uh, wild animal smell. So, you know, uh, we're redoing all the carpets. My thought was, if I get all the painting done, any drips, they're just going to go. They're just going to take the carpets away, right? Yeah. So uh, this was this was intense, especially as I had the room such a huge friggin' mess and wanted to have <laughs> it ready for Thursday. Uh, here's a spoiler for the video. At one point, got my days of the week wrong. And then all of a sudden, I realized that I had an extra day. So that was exciting. <laughs> hmm. Well, Freddie, you said you've got something that you're working on, too. Like, I've got my secret project that I'm excited <laughs> to announce the world. What you got going on over here, man? Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it's still fairly in development. There's a lot happening still. But uh, it's going to be a new take on on Star Wars, uh, including Legends and everything else in between. Uh, it's a bit of a cinematic experience. And you know what? I think I'll just leave it there for now. What a cinematic experience, including yeah. Legends. I know that you've gotten some new video equipment, so uh, exactly I'm excited, excited to see what you're gonna uh, do. Let's see, Rick. Rick, uh, he's gonna have his hand in it too. So, and and so are you. You don't even know it yet. If it's That's a video how... project, you want Rick. <laughs> Say that much. It is. It is. But if I want a nice XR Coon style background, I know where to go. <laughs> well, I've got you. I've got that for sure. I got twelve feet of it. In fact, man. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it was a ton of work. I'm very excited to get to show it with everybody. I'm excited to share it with the $10 and up uh, patrons tomorrow. But tonight's show is free for all. Excited to dump this on the world. I mean, share this with the world. So without further ado, Rick, let's get it started. everybody and welcome to legends look back proudly part of the utini podcast network a star wars books podcast that we're trying to format into a holocron where we celebrate our rich eu history as well as dive into lesser known star wars classics i'm your host jared mays and i'm joined tonight by my legendary co-hosts emily daybeck oh <laughs> wait hold up emily emily are you there uh for our audio only listeners right now what we have Coming to us from the sands of Tatooine, Emily is actually on vacation, so she is not here with us. She did, however, send us the spectacular photo earlier. What was the name of the place, guys, that she's at? Did she tell us? Uh, I'm not I'm so self-absorbed sure. that it, she gave us looks, an answer and I forgot it. <laughs> she mentioned it, it looks briefly. like Yuma. It looks like Yuma. It looks like Dunes for sure. Definitely the Dunes. I mean, it uh, looks it, like she could be standing right on top of the Sarlacc pit, doesn't it? Yeah, it almost looks like so. So driving from California to Arizona, like from uh, usually around San Diego, you will hit the uh, basically the these dunes. They look just like that. It's just a sea of dunes forever and ever and ever, and uh, yeah. very popular. Man, it's cool. I mean, one of my big lifetime like travel goals is to go to Star Warsy locations, either places that were in the filming of Star Wars or other significant Star Wars destinations. That would definitely be one. It has now made my list. Yeah, it's the Big Dune Recreation Area in Nevada. So Emily, we'll be very missed tonight. Uh, very missed tonight. We've got an uh, exciting show planned as we wrap up the Rule of Two Roundtable, but she got a little baby moon is. Uh, a baby moon in. I almost said, uh, that's no baby moon. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't. So it That's a count. good one. Um, that's a good one. I like that. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. I'm glad it passed your, <laughs> passed the Rick dad joke test. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, yeah and what's funny is i saw that picture come in from emily while i was out in the middle of my driveway shoveling a foot of snow she said greetings from tattooing and i said greetings from hoth i guess <laughs> that's so funny which freddie followed up very quickly with this hey guys <laughs> freddie was on the beach <laughs> so a little, uh, little burnt if you're keeping track Emily was at the Dune Sea. I was in a, an absolute snowstorm. 
which is way worse in Arkansas because nobody knows how to get it clear. And I don't have a, a, what do you call those things? Snowblower anymore. I had to do it all with a shovel. Got a much longer driveway too. It was a whole thing. And then uh, Rick, <laughs> you, you said you were somewhere fun too. Uh, yeah, Jared, I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm trying to do my best here on Hoth, <laughs> just, uh, trying to make it work. Um, I'm, I'm freezing my butt out here, man. They took off school today early. We got school canceled for tomorrow. Um, Hey, but the good news is, uh, I think I see something warm over there. So, um, I'm going to go, uh, go get some, some warmth. Oh, he's and, inside uh... the, the Tauntaun guts. <laughs> and I thought they smelled bad oh. on the outside. <laughs> So that's all I got. <laughs> Rick said he that had something awesome. and he didn't tell us what it was going to be. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely enjoyed that. So uh, welcome to Freddie. Welcome, Rick. Guys, I'm excited <laughs> to kick off tonight's show. I'm excited for us, of course, to continue into our discussion of the, what is it, Darth Bane rule of two. Um, tonight, we're going to finish up some of the character discussions. We're going to move into the overarching questions. Uh, did see a friend of mine the other day posted on Facebook. She had picked up uh, the new High Republic book, Midnight Horizon, hmm. and Rule of Two at the same time. Nice. Just so happen to be the exact two books that I've read this week. Hmm. I mean, amazing when uh, the forks, the force works like that, isn't it? Indeed. Very interesting. So, yeah. Big shout out to. Her. Now, I do want to give a huge shout out to all of our new patrons. Going to do a new patrons update here. I'm going to give a huge shout out to Nathan Roberts. Oh, I used to have a friend named Nathan Roberts. What if it's the same guy? That'd be cool. I used to play the tuba. <laughs> Nathan Roberts, if you play tuba, what's up, man? Tuba players. And if not, what? If, did you play tuba, Rick? Yeah, man. <laughs> I love that. I uh, Stephanie Mack as well. Uh, Stephanie Mack, uh, one of uh, our big fans over here at Legends Look Back. And also uh, Jacob. I have to figure out how to pronounce Jacob's last name. So, uh, Jacob, way to go. Thank you for being one of our patrons. Also, to our annual patrons, want to give a huge thank you to Brandon Medley and Adam as well. Guys, we're not going to do Thracken's Thrift Store tonight. I do, however, want to give at least a minute here to the Legends Lookout. Uh, we've got to at least say something about this. Freddie, you're the one to kind of interrupt a big argument happening behind closed doors at Utini. <laughs> big dramatic hubbub about what we thought of a certain book and freddie said oh hey by the way guys happy 25th anniversary to a new hope the special yeah. edition yeah the one that i that uh i mean i grew up on this I, I feel like the first introduction you gave me jared we were talking about the special editions and how that was my formal i wouldn't say my formal introduction but you know being a kid getting to see that in theaters yeah, for the first time, really, in that, and I felt like I was seeing Star Wars, you know, for the for the very first time, along with everybody else. So yeah, same here. Uh, packed packed house. I mean, there was a ton of people there. Um, my my cousin was actually in a uh, he had a he was playing basketball at the time, so he was handicapped. Uh, so we got in really early, <laughs> and this was in the day when when uh, it was free for all, right? There was no assigned seating. Oh and, sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, we got in. We we got a nice seat, and uh, I'll never forget that. So happy 25th anniversary, a New Hope special edition. Rick, did you get to see the special editions in theaters in '97? I did not. Nope. I saw the episode one, and you know the rest of the prequel trilogy. But uh, yeah. I did. I did see Empire Strikes Back in theater uh, about four or five months ago, though. Um, oh, that's cool. Yeah, and that was an awesome experience. Like I I love that. So um, not a New Hope. There's nothing like seeing Star Wars movies in the theater. There's nothing yeah. quite mm -hmm. like it. Uh, yeah, Freddie, I've shared the story a million times. Just briefly, I don't know if I've got a happier memory in my entire life <laughs> than standing in the rain with my dad was a dean of students at a college, which is like 50 college students in us. The fervor for this movie was just phenomenal. People were so excited. like They weren't even bothered that we were waiting in line in the rain for a half hour. They didn't yeah. even, they weren't even mad. And we got in and I was like sitting in my dad's lap because it was like before stadium seating so that I could see over the head of the college student in front of me. And then the text starts going and he's reading it as fast as he can, as quietly as possible. And, and I'm just like, I'm seeing something unreal here. That Star Destroyer comes overhead, mm. went straight from there to, um, to Walmart to buy me my first Star Wars toy. 
Nice. The uh, <laughs> Luke Skywalker's land speeder, which I believe just gave a ride to Chopper, um, Sassy Tin, and Ahsoka last night. Gave them nice. a ride uh, <laughs> to the grocery store or something to pick up milk for the snowstorm. Oh yeah, um, nice. Yeah, there's nothing like nothing like getting to see a Star Wars movie <laughs> in theaters. Now, uh, what else we got here, um, guys? I think it's time for the show, don't you? Time for some Darth Bane. Yeah, let's do it. All right, Rick, roll the ad, and we'll be right back with Darth Bane Rule of Two. It's, it's what Jimmy oh McGinty God, says. Oh, my God, Charles Falco needs. is absolutely Charles is calling. <laughs> Put him on. Put him on. Uh, wait, is this the first time caller? <laughs> uh, hello, you are live on The Living Force. Uh, uh, yes, uh, what, what's your question? My question is for Wes. Uh, why does he think that he can do my job? <laughs> <laughs> Corey put me up to it. Oh my god. Because <laughs> Corey made you do it? That's your answer? No, oh, man, this was... was... I'm enjoying the show. I won't interrupt anymore. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how canon is Darth Bane? Hmm. Obviously, he is is you know samurai body voiced by Mark Hamill is in season six of the Clone Wars, and they reference you know Bane's order and all that. Uh, you created the rule of two, oh! but um, <laughs> he this is the worst Yoda I've ever done. I'm getting tired. It's been a long week. Is that what that was? I, I didn't. I thought, even... you were, I thought you were having a voice moment. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even get the word fit. structure right. Oh man. Edit that in post, Rick. <laughs> Um, how can you put this image of my in my head of Piet just whipping out an Uno reverse card and slapping it down? <laughs> <Bam>. Take that. <laughs> yeah, I don't. That Vader does not play Uno though, so I don't think that be, that would be a wise long term no, discussion. He, he doesn't have the patience for it. He just force chokes everybody. <laughs> exactly. Now, last week, we discussed Darth Bane, the rule of two, specifically talked about Bane for quite a while, talked about Xana a little bit as well. We'll talk about Xana a little bit more tonight. Um, you know, we'll have to talk about Bane some, uh, but we're going to get into the overarching questions as well. I went so far as to say on Twitter this evening that it is one of the very best Star Wars books ever written. You think it's a fair assessment, guys? We'll, we'll rank it at the end of the episode. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's... Uh... It's crazy how how much it reads like a Star Wars story, even though it doesn't talk about any of the same things that you've seen in the movies, right? Oh, like sure. The, yeah. Uh, the the ships are different. The people are all different. There's a whole series of 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 Jedi that we don't really know. Luke's not around. Leia's not around. Right. It it's it stands on its own very well, and it reads like. You give it to anybody? Oh yeah, that's a Star Wars book. That's Star Wars for sure, right? You, you can hmm. tell. When a lot of people say I got started with the Bane books, and they're some of my very favorites. Um, I, it's a really good point, Freddie. So many Legends books, you know, focus on the big three: Han, Luke, and Leia, or their children, right? Yeah. Um, and this is totally, a, a totally fresh group of characters, right? I don't want to say totally original characters because we discussed on an episode some time ago, Darth Bane's checkered history. He mm. isn't actually created by um, Drew Carpishan, hmm. right? <laughs> he's a he's originally a George Lucas character, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. It, that that's the interesting thing, right? I I, I feel like how how many how many good books are out there with a character that George Lucas created. And I mean, the author just absolutely kills it. There's, I feel like some, some of the original <laughs> legends books, you know, there, there's some uh, Leia impersonations. I'll call them that <laughs> don't quite yeah. stack up, you know, Leia's hard uh, to write. Well, yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, Bane, we never seen Bane. We, we've never seen him in, in movies. So he doesn't have any background, but, 
the way it comes off in these pages, it like whatever comes out, whatever movie comes out, is gonna have to, if they do anything with Bane, has to just really uh, slap me in the face. <laughs> it's gonna have to be good. I want to see yeah. some crawling little orbalisks biting into his flesh. Yeah. Getting, you know, I want to see some good live action orbalisks whenever this happens. I do, uh, you know want to say though he's a george lucas original character drew carpician does wonders with him especially considering he's also in this you know five issue miniseries jedi versus sith this little comic which is quirky for sure and then there's also you know the uh the kevin j anderson short story bane of the sith isn't that what it's called freddie bane of the sith i think so i'd have to look yeah it yeah i mean we've uh we covered this at one point probably for the yeah. last darth bane or we, we read the comic we're on like episode seventy six over here, Freddie. I've forgotten yeah, K- what all of KJ, our episodes have been. Right, KJ. <laughs> yeah, Kevin J. Anderson. Right. Uh, Bane of the Sith. Let's see. It was January two thousand one. That's what I'm seeing here. So then this comes out. You know, two thousand seven is Rule of Two. Two thousand six, I think, yeah. was uh, Path of Destruction. So, so this one yeah. came out in two thousand seven, covering a George Lucas character, who was also first written in a comic and then a short story. And now is on book two of a trilogy that are some of the very best Star Wars books ever written. And uh, we are going to talk about that book here tonight. Um, we talked about Bane last week. We talked about Xana a little bit as well. We didn't really have time to totally get around to all of the uh, the Xana questions, though. So uh, I want to ask, guys, you know, what parallels do you see between Xana and Bane's Sith training? What do they have in common? What sets them apart? Um, it's obviously not quite following the hero's journey that Luke Skywalker, you know, follows. <laughs> hero's journey. Different trajectory here. Well, I mean, you know, Rick, I'll let you take this one because I'm still formulating a little bit of Xana's in my head. Bane's, Bane's I feel like we have a good idea of. Yeah. Um, so I guess both of them have, you know, the, the Sith flair, a bit of cruelty, a bit of learning through failure and the harshest way possible. Um, but Xana, she really didn't get any help. You know, I feel like Bane at the, uh, the, what's it called? The Sith's Lord Khan's Academy or whatever he called it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Corban. Corban. Yeah. That it was, um, you know, it was weak and that was Bane learned to despise that, that version of Sith training. And so he made a lot of changes for Xana. Um, and so, yeah, there's some things that, you know, Bane still goes over with Santa, Xana, I almost said Hannah, just kind of had that. I almost did too. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Yeah. And so it's, um, yeah, I think they're, they're probably more different than similar in my mind. Yeah. yeah. That's a go good ahead. point. Yeah. So, okay. Let's, let's go to Bane, right? Let's go to his instruction. Bane's training is very much seeking knowledge uh, even when he was being trained by the Sith, but there's the there's the there's the kicker. Bane was taught by other Sith, right? So he has a full understanding of the different spe- spectrums of the Force, uh, and, and so does no, so does Zana, right? Zana also has an idea of the good, the gray area, and the dark side. Personally, I feel like that's that's how how they are similar because they understand the the varying aspects of what what the force does to a certain group right so like the sith is is not ex- banding together and making everybody equal right so, but that's not if that's not the sith then where does it fall probably a little closer towards the jedi right like uh towards the gray or side it's still dark they're still pretty dark but they're they're leaping out of pure darkness which is what bane wants right he wants the pure sith uh thing and and xana th- where they differ is is xana is very much focused on following this guy and protecting this guy where bane didn't really do that right <laughs> he didn't protect anybody but right. himself mm-hmm. so it, it's point. you you can kind of see a huge difference but there's definitely some similarities you uh you make a good point there that Bane takes out all the other Sith and Xana protects Bane, yeah. um, saves him. She's yeah. learning from a Sith. 
he learned from Darth Raven's holocron <laughs> and also the other, you know, Cordis and yeah. um, uh, Kasim. Yeah. Um, man, what great characters in these books. It's phenomenal. Each one is so distinct Seriously. and unique. Mm-hmm. I would say the big difference for me is that uh, they both have family as part of their lives in a key yeah. way. For Bane, he was abused by his father and then murdered his father. Mm-hmm. Good point, yeah. But for Xana, she actually had kind of a healthy childhood. I mean, she was close <laughs> with her. What, uh, for Star Wars? is it my brother. <laughs> there was a little group of them. You got to read the comic. You got to read the comic. So there's a little group of them. There's three or four. Uh, Tomcat, Rain. Who are the other ones? Bug. Uh, Bug. Bug was the one that met his unfortunate end, I believe. Right. And then I can't, I can't recall the last one. So then the childhood trauma involving family is what propels them into the dark path yeah. in some form or fashion. Um, and then, of course, in this book, Bane, uh, Zana's childhood relationships come back into play in a big way, which really leads me to the next question is uh, early in the story, they discover that her childhood you know, best friend, her cousin, Tomcat, uh, in this book, they, you know, give him his, his uh, real name again to make it a little less goofy like the 2001 comic. <laughs> uh, they ship from Tomcat to Darovit. Darovit, which sounds like a Star Wars swear word, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> Darovit uh, is still alive, and he sees her, and he's she's hanging out with this big, dark, and brooding man, and he's like, what are you doing? I can't believe you're alive. I'm so glad. And Bane says, kill her. And she says, there'd be no purpose. Kill him, and there's no purpose in his death. So she, what, explodes his hand? Explodes. Did she explode something that made his hand explode? Uh, I think she used the force to make his hand explode, which is terrifying. Yeah. It's, you know, someone asked me recently, Darth Bane, is it like, like, can my kid read Darth Bane? And, (laughs) you know, kids like about, 10 years old and and i i sat and i was thinking you know what this is a very uh very intense yeah experience (laughs) i'd say wait till like 15 yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i read it at 15 on the beach i feel like you gotta read it with the lights on (laughs) read it in the daytime you gotta beat the yin and the yang right you need a lot of good energy to read this (laughs) yeah it's like if i'm gonna watch a horror movie i do it during the day on a small screen with the lights on, surrounded by loved ones, I take lots of breaks for snacks. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only only way I can do a horror movie. Yeah, I, a, I, I worked out to this to this audiobook. It was it was intense. It it would uh, get your adrenaline going <laughs> mm-hmm. for sure. I remember I was running to uh, the Pizat game from book one. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. I <laughs> don't know where I was going with that. Ultra marathon. <laughs> I remember thinking, like, this one scene is taking my entire three-mile run. I cannot <laughs> believe how long they were playing cards. Mm-hmm. But it was intense. Definitely, I was, was riveted. I definitely riveted. Now, here's the question, though. Obviously, the childhood trauma is a big part. Their relationships a big part of what makes both Zane, Zane, I did it again, <laughs> Bane and Xana Sith in their own unique way. But should she have killed Darovit back on Rusan? His, him being alive ends up coming into play in a huge way later in the book. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it would have helped her become a better Sith? Do you mm. think yeah, he was necessary to keep alive? Was it the Force keeping him alive? Hmm. At the time, I remember thinking, oh, that was kind of a sign of weakness mm-hmm. that she didn't yeah. take him out. Mm-hmm. This but, is an interesting thing, right? Because... You know, if you haven't read towards the end yet, or if you don't know what's going on, then you know we won't spoil it, of course. But it it, it really begs the question: like, what was, she, you know, her excuse at the very beginning was it was an unneeded, it was unnecessary. We didn't need to dispatch this guy's life, and really, there was a lot of reason to do that, right? I mean, no one should know that he, that he ex- that Bane exists. At least no one who's going to be as credible as this guy. This guy's pretty credible. I mean, he knows. He, he's he's like the first connection of of knowing the Sith. 
So in my opinion, that's where Xana could have probably changed a lot in this story. I mean, what would have honestly happened, right? If we got towards the end of this book and, you know, it, it, it just, it's a very curious thing. <laughs> it's honestly a very hard thing to, to really take in and, and figure out. Was she influenced by the force, right? Was, was the reason, the feeling, was that a force thing that kind of changed the direction of things because of how chaotic everything was starting to be or hmm. uh, correction, right? It's, there's a lot of things that play into it. It's crazy. Yeah, what do you think, Rick? Um, yeah, similar to a lot of what Freddie said, I think that, um, you know, I originally thought it was a weakness that her letting him live was she was looking for an excuse to impress her master while still having some empathy for him. I mean, it isn't it doesn't read like empathy, but still like I mean, yeah, imploding exploding someone's hand is not very empathetic <laughs> as much uh, as she could empathize. Exactly, yeah. Um and so um you know, and, and I again without trying to get into spoilers, it would have prevented some problems, but it makes for a good story that she didn't, you know, and so I can oh, understand we're, we're, it. We're full, we're full spoilers. Yeah. Full spoilers. Um, we didn't spoil the ending last week simply because I hadn't finished reading the book. All right, <laughs> I'll admit it. I hadn't finished it, but I have now. I have now. I just couldn't quite get the summary right. I've read the book four or five times, but, you know, you read 100 Star Wars books in between each reread. Yeah. You forget the some of the details. Yeah, you know, and that's one of the big things about Xana in this book is you think, because it is so open-ended, you don't know what happens to her yeah. her history. You don't know, is she actually going to be his Sith successor? Say that five times fast. Or is she going to fall back to the light? Darvit believes that that she can be turned and sees that, imp that empathetic side that you've just talked about. Mm -hmm. Darvit sees that and gambles that she is going to turn back to the light and she doesn't do you think do you think he was wrong to believe in her it's one of these things in star wars we believe in the redemption story mm. luke skywalker redeems darth vader i mean that is the core the heart of star wars and this time he gambles on it and it doesn't work hmm. do you think there was light in xana do you think he was wrong to try this hmm Interesting. Um, so I think uh, kind of on like a, a worldview level almost, I mean, sure, I believe there's good for everybody, um, you know, and so maybe she could have been redeemed, um, brought back. Um, at the same time, though, I really don't love Derivit as a character. He just annoys me. <laughs> and so it's kind of like there was no hope, foolish boy, you know, or, you know, man, man child or whatever. So. Um, one-handed farmer yeah and so i i um i don't know i didn't really didn't feel too bad when that plight failed or when that that plot point failed um you know but yeah i believe that anybody's within redeeming uh but definitely not every <laughs> every star wars villain is going to be redeemed or should be redeemed you know <laughs> so yeah that's a good point that's a very good point why why should we redeem some of these villains like how often does redeeming actually happen right it it, it keeps things a little spicy and uh i mean there's there's a lot of evil in the galaxy that's about to happen right mm. and that has to that's i mean that all, that's all happening right that's all happening it's all the machinations of 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 pure the opposite of the Jedi well, and we all know the Jedi are going to rebuild and, and the, the light side of the force is going to be way overbalanced. And in order to meet that, you know, we're going to get some very dark things happening. And, sure. uh, you know, we see it in Plagueis, the number one canon book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's never going to die. That's right. Well, the fact of the matter is, from my perspective, that makes the book so much better, so much more Shakespearean mm -hmm. in the sense that you kind of are rooting for this character. And then when she doesn't mm. take that redemption, when it's offered and there's not a happy ending, mm -hmm. that is kind of what makes the book such a masterpiece. Mm. Uh, yes. Same as revenge of the Sith. It is yes. heartbreaking, but beautiful for it. Oh, beautiful yeah. for it. And I think oh, that actually man. makes the, uh, it also makes the, 
the redemption of somebody like Darth Vader all the more powerful mm-hmm. because a lot of times people have that option and don't take it. Mm. And so when it does work, it really pays off more, don't you think? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the way and the way her her anti redemption went was mm-hmm. absolutely chaotic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Right. You know. You know, as I'm rooting for and against Xana on the one hand, I'm kind of like I want her to live up to her Sith potential. The mm-hmm. other part of me likes her. She's a really lovable character. She's yeah. connected to family. She takes care of Bane, even though he doesn't take care of her, and yet has her own unique angle on being a Sith in terms of she is into the alchemy side, the sorcery side of things. She's got a double-bladed lightsaber. Yeah, um, man. More secretive and yeah, yeah. Uh, she's like a, a double agent. She uses men to get what she wants. And then murders them. I mean, she's really compelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it leaves me in this weird space where I'm at with Bane and uh, something like Plagueis, for example, where there's like no protagonist, really. Would you would you say that the Sith are the protagonists, or do you find yourself rooting for the Jedi, mm. like uh, Valentine Farfalla and what's his what's uh, the other guy's name that's in this book, Johan. Uh, Jo- yeah, Johan. I almost called him Sebastian Rohan. But I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> yeah, do you it, find yourself rooting for or against the Jedi? Uh, hmm. Naturally, I do, right? And and when we get to their fate, it uh, it really sinks in. Like, yeah, you're right. Like this book can't can't we can't lose these guys. <laughs> According to Star Wars and Star Wars history, we know what's coming, and that's the that's such the crazy. That's a that's how I don't even know how to explain it, but that's the crazy thing with this book, is that although we have a general idea of what happens in Star Wars, it still an it, it still just throws you into a completely new realm of of like okay, I, as much as I want these guys to win, like you really want the Jedi to win, unless you're Heather or mm. you know <laughs> one of our other uh, dark side loving friends in in the uh, Utini verse, hmm. but uh. You know, it, it, it's it's the reality, though. That's that's what I feel like a lot of this book is. It's reality, right? And often, evil doesn't serve doesn't doesn't give justice. It it takes a while, right? And and uh, especially when you're so deceptive, like the Sith. So it's a very it's a very interesting take. Mm. It's almost biblical. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. A Valentine Farfalla for me is one of my very favorite Star Wars characters. It's with the way that he believes in Hoth in Book One, and. Like, even though when Hoth is an absolute jerk to him, yeah. he okay. continues to persist with kindness, yeah. but is also like flamboyantly fashionable. Yeah, it's like, a, it's uh, like a Fabio to me in my head. Yeah. See, I can I can I have it for a second? I um, absolutely. So, I'm gonna disagree a little bit now, Jared. That last point you made about uh, the 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 character growth between him and Hoth is great. I, I'm with you there, but. I kind of had the mindset going into these books that this is an anti-hero story. You know, you're yeah. going to like the Sith. It's just part of it. And so right. I really did not like most of the Jedi. <laughs> and, like, um, Farfalla, he reminded me of, like, uh, I've said this before, but, like, a, a annoying Thor um, <laughs> kind of figure where he just, like, he's obnoxious. He comes in the room and you just ugh, roll your eyes and, like, I just didn't like him. Like, like you said, there's some great moments for him, and so you might might sway me a little bit. But I, um, you know, I kind of enjoyed watching the Jedi fl- flounder. Is that the word? Um, sure. And so I, I enjoyed it. You know, it was very different, a different take, different perspective. But it could right. just be because I had that mindset going in of everything <laughs> yeah. is inverted. So I don't know. You know, right. the the crazy thing, Rick, is is during the fight with the Jedi, I was doing some squats. <laughs> I was doing some nice squats. I gotta get ready for when Jared's here. I gotta oh. I gotta get the uh, the Sebayoth you know workout going on. I was curling uh, those <laughs> those donuts. You know. <laughs> So I was listening to that whole fight when I was working out and mm. and there was a second in my life where I was like, oh my goodness, I feel like I would want to be a Sith because you're just so powerful. Mm. <laughs> because you see you see the Jedi, right? And there's battle meditation. And there's good. battle meditation. There's an Ithorian <laughs> who 
is absolutely the strongest person in the entire fight because he's sitting in a corner using the very best superpower in all of the EU, <laughs> battle meditation. Yes, an Ithorian doing battle meditation. Man. Yep, yep. That was that was so cool, man. But but once they figured out the strategy and the fact that Bane was, I mean, they were really trying to harm Bane, and and there was a high chance that it could have been successful. But if it, it you know, that's where you see how powerful the Sith are. Without that battle meditation, mm -hmm. they were like nothing, man. They were they were just like, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> yeah, it's over quickly. Yeah. yeah, it is absolutely one of the best lightsaber battles ever written oh, yeah. in all of the eu oh totally definitely I'll go out on a limb definitely and say the final battle in rule of two is one of the top five very best uh lightsaber battles ever written yeah um definitely the most memorable scene in the whole trilogy for me yeah oh most memorable in the whole trilogy other than the very last chapter of the trilogy but yeah um, oh yeah but yeah, it's it's very very good writing and just good story. Totally. Not the Pazak totally. the Pazak <laughs> game. I mean that was good too. It was really fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I mean it, it even in the audiobook, like I, yeah. I just don't get it. But it, it can really just suck you in, and you're just listening to this whole thing happen, and and you're yeah. seeing it, which is nuts, right? Like the fact that you can visualize it. So, mm. you know, I'm thinking. Uh, Maybe one of these these uh, Patreon exclusives, we're going to read you some passages of Bane. Oh, man. Oh, I want to be the Ithorian. Okay. <laughs> Please. Can I, can, I make your, can I make your voices and be the translator for you? Oh, that yes. would be cool. <laughs> There's a bunch of us at Utini who love Ithorian and yeah. I, I, Ithorians. Andrew and Corey and me in particular. In KOTOR, the fact that there's so many conversations where – like you can't skip it, and they just talk <laughs> out of both sides of their faces, and they go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And I just sit there like, yeah, no big deal. This is normal. And then my wife walks so in. Funny. She's like, what are you doing in here? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess that sounds weird to somebody who's not immersed in this stuff. <laughs> That's funny. Well, we've talked about the characters. There's so much more, so much more we could say. Uh, I, I'm a little bit on the fence on this particular question. Um, is there – a hero like is there a, a protagonist of these books um do you find yourself rooting for or against the jedi i'm a little bit on the fence I, uh, johan is very fallible is obsessed with the death of his master so he's a jedi you, you like you don't really mind watching him bite it <laughs> but, he but also i love sad. i love yeah, farfall farfall with every not. fiber of my being but johan and the he's only had one. a heroic death he's the only one who didn't have the blinders on though about the sith you know and and True. so that made him more admirable for, to me because Farfalla was like, "There's no problems, everything's fine. This is peace, and you know all that." So, I'd love for you to paint this Farfalla you have in your head, and <laughs> I would love to see Jared paint his version and just see how different they look. <laughs> That'd be My, fair. Man, he is. Oh, I love him. I love him. Yeah, yeah. but the, just like yeah. any prequel era Jedi, they're 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 fallible. Yes. Yeah. Sure. They they're high and mighty, but they have extremely redemptive qualities. Obi Wan, for example, you know, I mean, you you can't not love Obi Wan, right. and you also there's no way around the fact that he is absolutely to blame for everything that ever went wrong in all of Star Wars. <laughs> I could maybe try to argue it just for argument's sake, but uh, it's not his fault. We're talking about Bane. <laughs> yeah, 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 That's the, yeah. We'll move on. We'll, yep. We're going to do a lot of Obi-Wan this year. The Kenobi, yes. this new Kobe, mm. Kenobi comic announced today. Mm. In fact, as of recording this show, uh, we've got the Kenobi show. We've got the Essential Legends collection coming out. Uh, this, we're going to have plenty of time. Plenty of time. Now, let's get into the overarching questions for a few minutes here. I've got a quote. Very rarely do I pull this. Oh, I should have pulled up the audio book. Uh, no, my phone is my camera. I was like, where's my phone? I don't have it. <laughs> now, Here's a quote. I'll do. I'll just uh, read it myself. Bane said on page twenty-five: "Few be few beings in the galaxy ever get what they truly deserve." He noted, choosing his words with care. The dark side was not easily understood. Even he was still learning to work his way through its complexities and contradictions. He had to be careful not to overwhelm his young apprentice. Yet it was important that she grasp the essence of what he had done here. Our mission is not to bring death to all those unfit to live. 
we answer to a greater calling. All I have done on Rusan and all that we will do from this day forward must serve our true purpose, the preservation of our order and the survival of the Sith. Hmm. Man, first of all, it's some amazing writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Second of all, he, he mentions the complexities and contradictions of the dark side. Mm. I Whatever I was doing, I might have been running at the time. I stopped, paused, and wrote this down. I can't wait for us to get into this question. What, in your opinion, are the complexities and contradictions of the dark side? It might be the most difficult question I've ever asked on Legends Look Back. Hmm. I've, I've got a thought. Freddie, you want to go first? Um, not really. I'm still thinking. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll jump in. So um, what I, I think of immediately is um, – oh, gosh, I forgot the phrase – um, so like natural selection evolution, you know, mm-hmm. the strongest survive and, and continue to, um, to propagate, go forward and all that. And so the rule of two is not logical. If you want to keep an idea going, you know, you, if you're talking about sp- the spread of ideas or, or beliefs, you want to have as many people share those ideas or beliefs as possible. And so the not very great evangelism. Right. The, uh, yeah, definitely not. Sith Lords. Definitely not. Right. And so the idea of having a one master and, and one apprentice is very contradictory. And, and the idea of you want the, the dark side uh, and the, the legacy of the Sith to endure. Um, because, you know, all it takes is a super skilled Jedi to really knock out both master and apprentice, and it's done. So hypothetically, you know, it could have happened. And, you know... Um, it would have been eradicated. So um, that's the first thing I see, I guess, is, um, you know, for, for this to really work, you have to, instead of expanding, you have to limit and refine. Um, and so that's something that I thought of. I'll come back after my brain restarts a little bit. That's a good point. That's a good so, point. You know, what you got, Freddie? This is where I feel like you have to dig into, like, the fundamentals of what is the dark side, what is the light side. And we see the light side uh, of the Force being order uh peace dipl- diplomacy right uh, equality etc on the other side we have chaos uh search for power right uh and relentlessness selfishness it's everything opposite of what what the light side are and, and it's very much the you know george lucas wrote this with heaven hell kind of thing in mind right the sith were obviously the demons and within that as you heard is is chaos right but but a lot of these things conflict with each other because how can you preserve an order when there's no order with chaos right so like Mm, surely the dark side of the force should probably be just like some insanely crazy person that's just pure darkness who doesn't like there's no I don't know. I mean, there's no thought, but you can't do that. You see that with a couple people like Niall and Vitiate. Yeah. But then you need deception, right? Deception is important too, because lying, uh, it's the same thing. It's everything opposite of of what the Jedi would be, truth and lying, right? So it just seems like there's almost too much chaos, and it's like trying to describe the word nothing. What? How do you describe nothing? But then you turn it into something, Hmm. right? So that's why I feel like there's a lot of interesting things because you can't be too chaotic you have hmm. to be just a little chaotic because if, if you go too far off the deep end then you become some you know pure energy of darkness whereas if you do the other thing you become a bleed glowy <clears throat> that's right this reminds <laughs> me freddie of the quote from 30 rock when tracy jordan says um we're diving into into the philosophical deep end hmm. and if you grab onto me we'll both drown <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah. that's where I feel like we're at with this. That's a good point, though, because in, in SWOTOR, right, in Star Wars The Old Republic, this is not the biggest spoiler for it. It could be considered spoilery. I don't think so, but it's it's at least in Revan, in, that, in the Revan book. <laughs> so you've been warned. Give me 15 seconds here. Vitiate, the Emperor, mm-hmm. is a planet consumer. He consumes life energy. Yeah. He is He is a void. And lives forever, right? He's eternal by consuming 
he is is endless dark side hunger, what you're describing, Freddy. Yeah. And even some of the Sith Lords realize he's too dangerous to be left alive, right? They they, they realize that's not good for the Sith. That's not good for the galaxy. It's not good and for the, anything. <laughs> and so they have to take him out. So even the Sith team up with the Jedi, some Sith, in order to take him out, right? Hmm. So there's a contradiction. Mm-hmm. I would say with another one in this book, Xana reflects on the fact that Bane had never been a father to her. Oh, yeah. He had been a harsh master, but never like a father, never a father figure. You've got a, a grown man raising a little girl, but is not like a father. But he needs her to not kill him prematurely so that she can learn enough to keep the Sith going, mm. but also not hate him too much. And so then you see Xana choose to save Bane, even though she doesn't love Bane. Uh, this this whole issue of like, what is their relationship like? The complexities of their relationship really, yeah. really was throwing me for a loop as I was reading. Mm-hmm. You know, the visual I had in my mind when I pictured them, and it really helped me understand their dynamic was, uh, I don't play God of War, so I apologize in advance if I get these names wrong. But there's you know, that video game, God of War, uh, where is it? Kratos? I don't know. Uh, anyway, he's got his son with him, and, and uh, y- you kind of go, you play this video game, right? And, and your son's tagging along, and he's like, you know, kill that kill that deer, right? And it's, he's trying to teach him how to hunt, and it's very matter-of-fact. Not so much, not so sure. much like, are you okay? It's just like, if you die, you die. <laughs> you need to learn how to survive. <laughs> hmm. So... It's more of like a, a mentor, if anything, but, you know, this person doesn't care about Xana's life. There's so many of these contradictions. I think, like, yeah, why would she respect him enough to follow his crazy rule that he just invented? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, when the entire point of the dark side is, like, take shortcuts mm. and achieve power at any means necessary, but she's not allowed to team up with anybody to overthrow him. She has to do it by herself. Yeah. So can, why wouldn't she take the shortcut when that's the entire mm, point of the Sith? Can I um, yeah. ramble a little, a little bit more about uh, the Force philosophy? <laughs> um, yeah, so y'all got me thinking. This is a great, great question. Um, you know, I think going back to the way George Lucas set up Star Wars in the universe, he, he drew from a lot of like Eastern um, philosophy and religion, you know, Taoism, the yin-yang of two good and evil and balance. Um, and I think in Star Wars and, you know, maybe in, in um, our world too, that maybe that's a, a false dichotomy where neither of those are the right option. You know, we see sure. we see by the sequel trilogy and, um, and also a Legends, but how the Jedi Order is flawed and it fails and it, it ultimately does not measure up. I think the same is true with, with you know, the Sith. And so on mm-hmm. a larger philosophical scale, like, neither of them really understand the force. They're just attempting to make sense of it and yeah. make a way that it's understandable. I have the, you know, the Jedi and the Sith code pulled up in here and, you know, they have very different paths that they, they take, but they both arrive, you know, as an understanding of the force. And so I think they just misunderstand the force, but they have to stick to their, their worldview or their, their way of making sense of it. Um, yeah. But I think that they're, you know, they're wrong that there's a third option or, you know, a different option, that um, hasn't been in the mainstream story of Star Wars yet that maybe we'll see in some of the new stuff um, that's really interesting. Uh, Rick, do you remember from college the parable of the blind men and the elephant? Oh. Um, you ever heard this one, Freddie? No, I haven't. This it's... is my favorite little parable. I tell this thing all the time. Go for it. The Six, the six Men of Indostan. It's a... Uh, a 19th century poem by William Godfrey Sachs, hmm. but it's an, it's older than the poem. The poem is perfect. You look it up. The, bl- the, the blind men of Indostan, the six men of Indostan. The idea is there are six blind men all grasping at an elephant, making conclusions oh. about what the elephant is. Yes. So one touches the tail and says, I know an elephant is like a rope. Oh, okay. Another touches the ear and says the elephant is like a fan. One touches the side of the elephant and says an elephant is like a wall, right? So forth and so on. Um, They each 
reach logical conclusions based on the part of the elephant they have access to, but they're blind. They can't see the bigger picture. Mm. They don't, they, they get so cemented on their conclusion that they don't feel around for more of the elephant either. Mm-hmm. And people use that about religion. Now, I, as a Christian, <laughs> my perspective on it, you're welcome to disagree with me. I won't be mad. My perspective is that we're not just grasping around in the dark. I believe in divine revelation that God has turned the lights on and has revealed himself. Mm. Now, we don't have to get into that to any more <laughs> detail other than to say with Star Wars, I think it works really well. Mm. With Star Wars, I think it works really well that that uh, the Jedi and the Sith are both just grasping around in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're both touching opposite parts of the elephant. Yeah. And they can't meet in the middle. If yep. you want to see George Lucas's vision of what the Force is, uh, I definitely recommend the Mortis trilogy in the Clone Wars. Mm-hmm. It will mm-hmm. it will truly describe a lot of events to you. The Legends and version. The the Legends, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's the this same is version. Before. This is uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, the Mortis trilogy will teaches you a lot about what like basically what happens in in the environment right like the force how it's how it's transformed uh it goes into like mythology which is very interesting uh but ultimately you know i I feel like the strong thing that could really i guess keep everything in balance is somebody right in the middle and that's what that's what anakin was supposed to be he was supposed to be the one that wrangles both the light and the dark Mm-hmm. But what happened was the the dark side of the force did something and got rid of the light, and that's where the whole de- de- diving into the darkness fully wrangled in happened. Mm. So, looking at it from that aspect, right? Like, I feel like in order to keep the balance of the force, you have to be right in the middle. And how, who, who did that? Let's Let's start with an R. All the gray Jedi. Oh, Evan. Evan. <laughs> I was about to say Ahsoka, Evan. but yeah, I gotcha. Definitely. <laughs> you know, uh, no, Revan we should do a Revan roundtable sometime. Mm-hmm. Like, just about the character, not the mm-hmm. book. Yeah. I mean, there, the, Revan is what a lot of, I would say, especially Bane, right? Aspire to be. And it's exactly like your parable. They're just touching one part of the elephant. And Bane sees, and we talked about this during the first book, Bane sees only the Sith part of Revan. He doesn't see the whole story. Right. Yeah. Like uh, Kylo Ren only sees the Darth Vader side of Anakin yeah. Skywalker. It doesn't know, yeah. doesn't know the whole story there either. What, what an episode this is. Man, been. yeah. We've <laughs> got, <laughs> thank we've you, got, Rule of uh, Two, for bringing out Philosophy of the Force 101. <laughs> we got the, the mural reveal, Emily's in Tatooine. We got elephants, religion, Mortis, <laughs> Woo, yeah. everything. We even get to the bouncers. Get to the bouncers, the uh, the goofy little fluff balls that read your mind. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got one last fun little question before we wrap up the show. Got to have some kind of a goofy little fun game to play when we do some kind of a round table. Here's my question. If you were a Sith Lord and you were going to have some kind of like unique quality, <laughs> some kind of unique, you know, like thing, it, when they put you in the Sith Lord encyclopedia, what would be the thing to remember you by? For Bane, there's a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, the one that I got in 2002, is 2003, between episodes two and three coming out, the new essential guide to characters. It's the one where he's covered. He's got the big goofy helmet, and the <laughs> yeah. purple lightsaber, and the Orbalisk armor. Looking kind of like Freddy's hat, honestly, like those neon <laughs> colors. Neon 90s Orbalisks. Yeah. What would be your unique, organic goofy uh, thing that sets you apart I, i'd like to think mm. you know we could we could expand the question narrow the question down to just say if you were covered in an organic uh <laughs> creature for body armor what would it be um uh, freddie you got something uh you know it, it's a little different so i'll hit this in two ways one i would like uh, basically a thing, right? So maybe some sort of ancient technology or mm. something I built. I don't know. Uh, 
that can turn into whatever weapon that I want. So it could be like, you know, hardcore brass knuckles, or I can whip it into like a katana or a mace. <laughs> this sounds kind of like, like be... the Yuzhan Vong Amphistaffs. There you go. Sure, I'll take that. <laughs> but um, uh, the other thing, if I were covered in something, I think it'd be cool to be uh, covered in like rhino beetles, <laughs> you know, like on your shoulders. Oh, mm. cool. With the horns. You're like very samurai-esque. That would be cool. That's a good idea. Hmm. I was thinking snakes. You... Just like yeah, yeah. they're all over your body. They slither to... Yeah, that's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> Just slither in. Intertwined. Uh, yeah. Into an armor. A mesh. Okay. That's right. Uh, so my first thought was uh, good old uh, slimy naked Palpatine. Just uh, just go slimy for something. Yeah, just you know, <laughs> someone tries to hold you down and whoop, you just slide out of that. Um, like those water wigglers. Yeah, there you go. Um, but then um, then I thought I'm gonna go back to my my poor conception of the Orbalisk and go for a like Ninja, Ninja Turtle Ninja. Yeah, Ninja Turtle turtle shell, and be uh, Darth Donatello with my whole little cave I can go into and retreat. So wait, did you nice. think the Orbalisk like there was just one single Orbalisk? Well, I knew that there were multiple. That he lived inside. But I pictured, yeah, like a shell, <laughs> like a like that's the only way that I can understand like the growing. Like it started as like a, a plate, and then it just expanded, and maybe had a couple of them, you know. But like, yeah, that that's that was my first read. That was my mental hmm. image, and so, so I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna... Put mine together with yours, and we'll see if this is the number one decision here. We're going to be a Sith Master who can call upon an object that turns him into Donatello <laughs> or or Michelangelo. So you've got the different weapons. There you go. But you've got the shell. Yeah, I like it. I like it. <laughs> I'm pulling the plug on this thing. All right, guys. How would you rate the book? What's your rating? What's your score? We didn't do this last week oh, on accident. Man. So let's do it here. Now at the end of the round table. Um, th this for me might be like a 9.2 or a yeah. 9.4 right in there. So we'll split the difference. Call it a 9.3, 9.3, like incredible uh, over a nine, one of the very best star Wars books, hmm. but it's probably like nine out of my top 10. Like it's probably toward the bottom of my top 10 hmm. star Wars books ever. Oh man. Okay. And I gave That's I gave Bane I gave the first book lower I gave it lower than that I don't remember what it is but yeah. just make sure we say it's lower I think yeah, this one's better. Interesting. I really I really like the first one because it it was very detailed and it was going through the martial arts I love that part man I could have had two books of probably just the details of everything he was doing and uh, you know come up with his his workout regimen whatever that was it's like a martial artist's dream. Hmm. Uh, I, I like there's a lot of training sequences <laughs> there is and, and you know the the Pazak, for instance going through that whole scene and and being at the table with this book it was very quick it was battling running away uh finding things like on a hunt on a search like he's he's not encumbered by anything now he can do whatever he wants and he's doing it but at the same time you know there's there's a threat looming and uh he also his his search for for everything. It, it's a very fast paced thing, right? There, there, it covers a lot of space, a lot of different places. So it's tough for me because I really like that first one and how detailed it was. But man, hmm. if you want to work out and work out really hard, <laughs> this is the book, man. I give this a solid nine. I'm gonna give it a nine, just under. We need a new Patreon show called Getting Fit with Freddie. Ooh. <laughs> Yep, and then then the counter show would be getting round with Rick. <laughs> getting round. <laughs> Speaking of which, my wife has been baking cinnamon rolls while we're up here. Oh. I can smell them wafting up. I can't wait to go down and grab some. What you got, Rick? So okay, um, I'm terrible at rating, so I have no clue what I wrote it rated for the the first book. And, no, me neither. <laughs> uh, honestly, this book didn't wow me as much on my first on my second read through as it did my first uh it's still an incredible book but i think in my head i'd built up higher expectations for it and so i think i'll feel better once i finish the whole trilogy and kind of you know complete the story uh so i'm gonna give it an 8.5 um still an incredible book but wasn't wasn't as good on the second read through for me that's fair 
That's absolutely fair. We got to read it a third time. There you and go. See how it does. Yeah. That. that's the way it goes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's the way it goes. Well, that does it for this week. Thanks, guys, for being here. And uh, looking forward to having Emily back here with us very soon. Uh, we've got a lot of more fun content headed your way in the weeks to come. Want to especially um, plug the new Patreon show coming out tomorrow. I've seen the early footage of it, and I'm really excited to share this with the world. So I uh, want to give everybody, you just have to be a $10 patron for one month to get the access. Um, you might want to be a Patreon subscriber for longer than that but you know i do want to get a chance to share this with the world come out tomorrow which is february 4th 2022 on uh eugenie's patreon i'm gonna do what are we calling it the yavin base build nice. episode one yavin base build episode one uh coming up next week on legends look back right here at uh 9 30 p.m eastern 8 30 central on youtubes.com slash utini we've got our valentine's spectacular the legendary love lives i'm very excited to get to share that with all of you want to give a special thank you to our patrons as we said earlier at the top of the show the new patrons do want to also say a special thank you to patrick ortiz carl sander ok indar and jg Kars on our jedi high council as well as elizabeth cloutier Sally and Chris Eilerson, uh, Freddie C. Yeah, yeah, Freddie C. Earl Q and Matt Billington on our Alliance High Command for their amazing support. I want to remind everybody to remember to sub to the channel and leave us a review in your podcast platform of choice. If you're digging the show, it might just help somebody else learn to dig it too. If you'd like your thoughts right on the show, you can email us at legendslookbackutini.com. You can send a message in the Legends Look Back Discord channel. You can, of course, leave a comment on this episode on YouTube. Find us on Twitter at Legends Look Back. Uh, Emily is at Darth Dayback. I am at Jared Q. Mays. Freddie. At Wake Up Freddie. And Rick. At Rick underscore Grace. If you're looking to buy some of these books, such as Darth Bane, Rule of Two, with that beautiful Simon Goynard cover, you can go on over to utini.com, click the book profile, and from there, click the Amazon link, and you can go on over. And it gives us, you know, like 4% to help keep the lights on. If you like the book after reading it, you can leave us a review there, too. We'd love to know what you think. Remember, everybody, keep the Eugenie fan code and be a force for positivity in the fandom. May the force be with you.